Well, Kate, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thank you. It's so lovely to see you, Alina. Oh, it's so good to see you. I, I haven't seen you online for a long time, but even longer in person. It's been a couple of years since the Miami She Recovers event. Yep. And I just have this vision of us all jumping into the swimming pool with massive pants that said no shame on them. <laughs> I can't oh, think of anyone right. there without having that image in my head. <laughs> that is hilarious. Yeah, that was a lot of fun just floating around with the girls chatting all day eating junk food it's amazing yeah so much fun well listen uh this is a um an encore appearance for you i don't remember how long ago it was i'll leave a link to your first episode where you really dive into your story i think we were talking about your first book back then the love sober what's the full title of the first book the first title is love yourself sober there it um, is there it is. And it's a self-care guide to alcohol-free living for busy mothers. Brilliant. So that was very much the kind of speaking to, at the time, the kind of mummy wine culture that was going on, especially in Britain that I, as I was experiencing it. Yeah. And some of those, that, that sort of foundational, what that kind of foundational self-care looked like for, for me and for Mandy. I wrote it with Mandy Manners. In terms of that being a carer, um, I think that that was it, you know, calling out the cultural stuff and speaking to us mums with with probably younger, younger kids, because we've grown up, kids are grown up, <laughs> yeah. you know, this is a few years ago now. So, yeah, yeah man, that mommy wine culture is alive and well here yeah. in the US. Yeah, I'm sure it is there, too. It's funny how when we transfer to the sober life it's, and surround ourselves with sober people, sober material it feels like mainstream comes with us, but it doesn't like yeah. the mainstream is still very strong and, you know, encouraging mothers to drink yeah. as a way of coping with the stressors of having young children. Yeah. hundred percent, hundred percent. And it's funny, isn't it? You do feel like that. I'm really, sometimes I'm really surprised that people are still buying into it. And then I'm like, Oh yes. Yeah. I know I live in my little sober bubble kind of <laughs> happily bobbing away but no it's alive and well here too yeah yeah it really is no listen and that's the point is that that we are able to create and cultivate a world a life of our own that uh, we're at the center of right yeah. and we can be we can take responsibility and cultivate the life we want we and I are both examples of of that so but let's talk a little bit about um how we got here um you know, I'm going to, I'm going to play a fun little game. I like to call the lightning round, which is always really slow. I'm pretty sure my listeners are <laughs> sick of hearing me saying that, but, um, when you first got sober, was there a book that really helped you start your journey? Yeah, it was the sober revolution by Lucy Rocker. The sober revolution. And she was the founder. She is the founder of sober Easter's. And that was oh. the first website in the UK. Well, I always say it's the first site when I Googled, am I an alcoholic for about the millionth time at 3 a.m., that <laughs> fateful day in 2012. It was the first time I'd seen a website that didn't scare the living bejesus out of me. It looked wow. like a magazine. I was like, OK, I, I can come here. It feels like a magazine. Simple as that. Very shallow, very visual for me. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, like the look of it, I'm on board, right? Shallow Didn't have invisible. a triangle, triangle with an eye on it or anything like that. <laughs> just just had a flower. No Illuminati sign. No. I'm I'm really I'm fine with the Illuminati now, but I, I wasn't then. <laughs> <laughs> didn't feel cultish or anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a, a lot of aversion to a lot of the traditional ways of getting getting sober, but it's so nice that there are new um ways that speak to women specifically yeah yeah that's awesome what was it about the messaging do you think that attracted you was it a message of hope or it was like a new way or what was it that attracted you yeah I think it was there were a couple of things I had in my past just briefly I have religious trauma 
Let's mm. go straight in for that jugular. Um, so the traditional, the kind of the traditional roots were, uh, they were basically, they were traumatic for me. So I tried a couple yeah. of meetings. As soon yeah. as I mentioned God, I was out the door. Like I yeah. was just like, ah! um, it was not accessible to me. You know, it, it wasn't accessible to me as someone who'd had that experience. Um, I didn't, I'm also, you know, I'm a writer um, and I'm very sensitive to language. Mm. And I knew that if certain words didn't gel with me, I wouldn't do it. Very yeah. bloody minded. But I was like, no, I'm not having any labels. I'm not. I didn't like the word recovery because I was like, well, this feels like discovery. You know, we've come a long way in terms of semantics and yeah. and sort of the the sort of patchwork element haven't we and this kind of I I but but back then like back 12 years ago and like you you're like you've been sober 30 years haven't you it's like almost yeah amazing so but it it felt very yeah it it the so soberistas it felt like positive it felt like hope mm. it felt like a an attractive choice it was a move towards goal rather than just a a desperation and the language was soft yeah. enough for me to get on board yeah I like that idea of moving towards something instead of sort of the deprivation yeah. mentality is good yeah I had a fair amount of religious trauma but when I got sober there was nothing else and I was so desperate I was like yeah whatever right. you say <laughs> I will yeah. do whatever you say yeah um, I think we had different kinds of religious trauma so mine was easily overcome but um so you joined Soberistas and yeah. you were able to find all the elements required for, re mm, let's not call it recovery. <laughs> I'm all right with recovery now. I've got over it now. <laughs> oh, okay. But anyway, like that healing part, you were able to stop drinking and you, yeah. did you have to go through that process of deciding whether you could moderate or not? Oh, my God. I mean, I've been doing that for decades anyway, that on, off, on, off. Trying to but moderate. Yeah, it. yeah, definitely. And yeah, so what I did is I, it was, it was like, okay, I've got to do this. It felt like a life raft. Someone had thrown me a life ring when I first sent up a blog. It's before the social media thing had happened. And I did but I didn't have, and now we would call them those those recovery tools. It was like I'd got some of it. So I'd got the connection. I'd got mm -hmm. community. I was very uh, fighty. So I was still in my my fight fight mode. I was like, I'm going to do this. So rebellious. Rebellious. And I am. <laughs> and I like uh, that about you. You're a little spicy for a UK girl. <laughs> <laughs> spicy. Um, but... After about a year, I did that. I did that thing, right, where the bad habits crept back in. Mm. I had didn't have any self care, so all of the stuff that then I went on to write about, discover, explore that that came in sobriety two point for me. It was like okay, this was the first big stint. It was it was just a year, and then after a year, I I did that thing of like oh I'm, I think I'm fine now. I've done a year. Um, you know, I've read lots of books. I had a lot of head knowledge. I didn't know anything about my nervous system. Mm. I didn't, still didn't have self-compassion. So I didn't have the toolkit basically. And surprise, surprise, the stress built up. And then, and then I went and I really thought I was convinced that I was, I knew everyone else had said, no, don't do it. But I was like, no, I am the one person that will get away with this. <laughs> and I wasn't. I was like, I'm unique. I, I'm unique. I'm special. And um, and yeah, the boost chatter started immediately. Mm. It, it started immediately. And I was so gutted. I was like, oh God, it they were right. They were right. They were right. So a couple of years on and off with long sober stints until and you know, and dur during that time, a lot of self-development was going on. Um and so I, you know, I studied the the science of happiness. Like I mm. knew that I, looking back, I was studied to be a coach. I studied the science of happiness. I am, um, once I'd got some good sober time under my belt in two point oh, I 
I realized that the nervous system was a piece. So I studied with Irene Lyon, who's, I don't know if you know Irene. Oh, her name sounds familiar. Amazing. She does the neurobiology of stress, all that nervous Ooh. system stuff. Um, and I started to put together, I got like, um, I discovered Tara Brack, you know, uh. the reign of self-compassion, which changed my life. It was yes. like that change my life having a self-compassion practice yeah. so slowly 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 these bits were coming I was gathering my little rocks in the stream and I felt like okay um and so the the, the day that I discovered Tara Brack actually and listened to the reign of self-compassion I it was my last day one touch with touch all the wood which is like eight years ago so hopefully touch of the wood yeah. touching, all, <laughs> touching all the wood listen that has a different meaning in the u.s <laughs> we say knock on wood because wood oh. is something else <laughs> oh, I I oh, i'm so not touching all the wood i'm a menopause <laughs> and then we'll go into that in a bit. listen we're going to talk about menopause <laughs> we probably should have talked about that right up front yeah we're too we're going to talk a little bit about menopause um yeah. um i told you this lightning round was very slow but i'm curious do you have like a go-to mantra or quote that you live by do you have like guiding principles what like on a day-to-day -day basis is there something that's kind of guiding you yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And i love that question uh -huh. it's um yeah so a yoga practice Ooh, i've had a yoga practice so that is daily um i have a mantra i've got a few that cycle around um i say to myself when i'm perfect and the inner perfectionist is kicking off i'm sober and the rest is good enough chop wood oh, carry water good. like um this too this too shall pass those kind of i love i love a mantra because they're such great mental hooks there yeah. was one and I love dishing them out to people like when I'm working with my clients, I'm like a real mantra peddler because I just find them so such good mental hooks. They're like yeah. little visual aids for a busy mind and for the addictive brain, you know. Yeah. And what else do I do? Like I do journaling. I do and an, I've started um, working with Tammy Salas, who's an amazing artist, women's artist in recovery. And I joined her community earlier on this year because I was like, I need something else in my toolkit. Yeah. Now that has been transformational for me. Mm. Um, as uh, I had a I had a car crash last year, and I've had some ongoing um, trauma within within the family, and it came to my attention that about a year and a half ago, I couldn't process fast enough. So I took myself off to therapy, took myself off to EMDR. Oh, and I started doing this art practice where I have I start working with a word. I learned some journaling techniques with her, some art, creative journaling, paint, making loads of mess. I did that. This one next to me. It's beautiful. Like, I mean, I just make your sweater. <laughs> Thank you. And then what I would do is I'd go stomping in the woods with my dogs and I'd listen to music, sensory stacking, and mm. I can shift my nervous system. And whatever stuff has landed on me that I haven't processed, I could, you know, I can metabolize it. So I would say to that question, I have such a kind of complex, complicated and high maintenance self-care routine now. Bro, me too. Um, I have to. Man. I know, I'm I so high to. maintenance. <laughs> I'm so amazed. I don't <laughs> mind it. I quite like it, really. I know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we can justify it. You know, we got to practice what we preach, right? Yeah. And we like got to we got to find the, the things that work. You know, so that yeah. that bit. I mean, that's an hour a day that I walk the dogs. I get the nature. I get the awe, and I will be metabolizing some word oh. or some feeling, and I will do voice notes. I might then write about it in the Substack. I do a Substack. Oh. Um, I will journal about it and I will paint about it. So that's what I'm doing at the moment. And that seems to it. just kind of clean the pipes. <laughs> clean the channel so that we can receive inspiration. Yes. And yes. Yeah. Listen, you said so many things right there. I love mm -hmm. this, this idea of rotating tools. Mm -hmm. 
right? Like you mentioned several different practices. Um, I love EMDR, but metabolizing feelings and processing all that stuff. Um, I feel like it's important to rotate some of these tools yeah. because they can get rote yeah. and stagnant. You're not really, I don't, I'll be using a particular, like I like to do manifestation journaling, but mm -hmm. if I do it for too long, like months, like it loses its it loses it. emotional yeah. impact on me. And it's the feelings like they say, you know, focus on the feelings that you want to attract. Yeah. Right. And yeah. release all the rest. And, um, I'm currently thinking about, it's so funny. You said the word awe, like cultivating mm -hmm. awe in your life. And that's something that is really up for me today. I was just journal journaling today about how do I mm -hmm. cultivate more awe? It always yeah. seems like it's about being present, being in nature, moving your body, metabolizing all the stressors. Cause you know, we have a lot of stress in our life and most, I don't know anybody who doesn't have a lot of stress in their life. I mean, I think that's just the nature of the times yeah. that we're in. So we need really need a way to process that stress yeah. so that we can respond, not react so that we can live peacefully, mm -hmm. detach when necessary. Cause my little trick, my little triggers get all inflamed and sometimes I spiral out and they take me down. So mm -hmm. I love all the things that you just mentioned. Um, and by the way, I'll leave a, remind me to leave a, uh, link in the show notes for the sub stack. We're going to leave links to all your things because yeah. you have a lot, you do a lot to help oh. the recovery community service oh, is really big you. for you. Yeah. Yeah. Keeps us sane. Um, Okay. That that's, that covers the self-care practice too, because, uh, I'm in my yoga girl era myself. <laughs> I was almost thinking I needed to get a tattoo, mm -hmm. another tattoo. Or I don't I'm know. so that's, I've been Googling tattoos this week. I'm so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I gotta go for it. What is it with yoga and tattoos? Like I have one, but yeah. I can't see it. So I forget that it's mm -hmm. there but I want one for my arm. Maybe, maybe you not. know, we are being those queen ages, aren't we? It's like that, <laughs> that 55, right? Queen age, yes. tattoo, yoga, yoga, badass situation going on. Yeah. I think it's been a good, almost 10 years since I got my very first one. So I was like 45 before I got yeah. my Me first too. like real tattoo. My first tattoo was eye eyeliner. <laughs> that didn't really count. <laughs> Anyway. All right. Let's talk about important things. So we're in that age. There's those of us that are, man, it seems like there's, I don't know if it's just me because of my age, but I'm seeing a lot of information about menopause. And, um, so this might not be super helpful for the guys mm -hmm. other than like, if you have a woman in your life who is going through this, it's important to know that there are some yeah. things that can help with it and yeah, some sure. typical, some typical side effects. So, um, and I, and I have my whole regiment, you know, to address it. But, um, when you, when you think about midlife, what are some of the issues that, that you see and, and how do you approach, mm -hmm. approach them? Yeah. Yeah. So tell me if I go off piste, by the way, I'll try and remember that. I'll wave at you or something. Question. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I'll just can't just press <laughs> like end of the Zoom meeting and I'll sort <laughs> me out. <laughs> no, I think it's, no, no, feel, feel free to speak from your heart mm. because there is so much to this and I don't feel like we're talking about it enough, mm. but yeah. I feel like people are starting to talk about it. So, mm. so I feel like um, this piece is, is very, very important because in terms of what I was seeing basically was on sober forums and myself included and then clients that I work with or people in the love sober community who had quite a lot of sober time were suddenly getting derailed and lapsing or really struggling when they start, when they went into their mid forties. So mm the early 40s mid 40s and that happened to me actually after that first year I now know because I remember having a real distinct feeling of change um I was actually on a little sober retreat as well at the time and I was like whoa everything's not right and I think that was when my perimenopause really started to kick in so the traditional recovery models that were there in terms of like, you know, my, and even some of the new ones. So in terms of 
behavioralism and mindset and routines these are all really important but there is a foundational health piece for yeah. women going through that that if that's not addressed leaves us vulnerable to lapse relapse mental health issues and really high suicide that's one of the, when uh, female suicide really peaks around menopause around 50 wow so all this shit is real and so um you know just as I, I trained as a coach there wasn't very much around at the time and then obviously I said I trained with Irene Lyon around stress and then when I realized this was happening um you know coincidentally there seemed to be this rise in the UK of awareness and I trained with the menopause school here to support women in menopause transition and to advocate for hormonal needs spot symptoms um and almost like reframe the language it's a bit like sobriety it was a bit like okay well we need to kind of this can be great this can be a good time for us if we are supported and have our foundational health needs supported it's it's a real rite of passage for women yes. so let's support this and then not live in fear of it not struggle so much with it not you know so it, it's really like point name and then let's sort it out you know yeah. and then we can celebrate then we can celebrate because we're still alive <laughs> right and we're getting yeah. older and that is yeah. a beautiful beautiful gift so let's yeah. just help support that so you know you you were saying so you know what are some of the symptoms is what I was also finding was that a lot of people a lot of women are kind of coming and coming to the sober conversation having gone I've been fine all these years but suddenly I I'm ha this is really impacting my mental health and da, da, da. so there's this just this piece this midlife piece yeah. where we're like okay it feels to me as a feminist like it was you know it would have really upset me before I got sober I've just gone it's just not fair you know because the blokes are still doing it but and and it's not or I hate that thing about men can do something but women can't do this oh yeah no no <laughs> however there is that element of female physiology where this is just disastrous for us so let's look after yeah. ourselves and really nurture support and advocate for our real needs in that yeah what are some of the symptoms that you see symptoms. I mean I can name off a few symptoms yeah. on so and it is symptom led. I don't know what it is like in the US for getting HRT, but I was sent away by a twelve year old doctor when I turned up and said I've got mood swings. You know, mood swings. Okay, mood swings. Uh, a lot of people don't get the hot flushes, but you know you can get the hot flushes. Yeah, I'm, I'll have to get my list out. The so I can name it. I can like, actually yeah. name a few that were really up for me. Um, was like um, brain fog, fatigue, yeah. Yeah. Um, lack of uh, sexual desire. I I joke around. It's not really funny, but I was like, oh, I'm dead from the neck down. You know, and it wasn't something that was within my control, and I wasn't suffering from that, but my husband was. He was suffering, girl. Oh, it's terrible for him. Um, and then, and then yeah. there was, and then truth be told, I was suffering. There was pain involved. And I was like, why would I want to do that anymore? That's painful. Like it wasn't like it used to be. And there was an element of shame around it or embarrassment that mm -hmm. like somehow I, I think I felt like it attacked my self-worth, mm -hmm. right? As a woman that I wasn't like this frisky. Yeah. You know, I want, I don't want to say gross words, but anyway, that I wasn't how I used to be. Mm. And uh, there was some shame involved in that. And just uh, what else? Um, yeah, I think that that was mostly it. And when I went to my doctors, they were both um, giving me the line that that is quote unquote normal. Ugh, right. Yeah. But yeah. Um, I have recently been exposed to menopause specialists who say just because it's normal doesn't mean it's okay no right no yeah and yeah, so that's and what the doctors were telling me I was like I have this lack of desire mm. and there's they're like well we can give you something for the pain but um that's just part of life so you need to learn to accept it and and this is you know where there's a big movement in the in the UK so there's all those symptoms that you that you said um yeah. and 
it's not just about the symptoms. That's that's the thing that really shocked me is basically about women's long term health. OK, yeah. so we need estrogen. So we're talking maybe, you know, the, there's there's all the lifestyle things that we can do quick. Not drinking is is a massive, massive one because yeah. the liver needs to metabolize whatever estrogen you've got in your system. And if it's prioritizing removing alcohol, it can't do that. So we're going to get worse symptoms. We're going to okay. get worse brain fog. We're going to get worse low mood. You know, all of those are going to be worse. Right. Sugar is another one that's really, really bad for us. Right. But we need this. We need estrogen or estradiol, which is is the one that that really drops perimenopause we get you know up and down up and down of it and progesterone and we right. need estrogen for all the 11 systems of the body so we need it for the brain we need it for brain function we need it but also the biggest diseases that are killing women so we've got a life expectancy longer than men but healthy life years is uh, i believe it's to 67 years old for women so we've got a really big we've got a real disparity in terms of life expectancy but healthy life expectancy right, and right. the biggest killers of women being um uh dementia the falling f with your bones from osteoporosis bowel cancer and there's the other one which i can't remember because i've got is it heart disease i think it's heart disease it could yeah. be i'd have to check are all uh, estrogen related so mm -hmm. these when you take hrt if you keep your east you need estrogen to protect yourself from getting those diseases okay. so we were we were given that whole fear thing around breast cancer which was a, a fake a, you know a fake study that's been debunked yeah the women's ago. health and, initiative in the u.s yeah so and actually really we bad. need we need that that estrogen so there's a big thing in the uk to help women advocate for hrt mm -hmm. or for you know for the the hormone replacement therapy because actually it's good not bad <laughs> so right. actually, that's the takeaway <laughs> yeah yeah um, yeah so and not everyone wants to it's very it's very personal but if if you're having those symptoms then that can really you know it can really alleviate them and it can really help them and if you've not got the history of estrogen related breast cancers in your family then actually taking hrt is going to have a protective factor against some of the biggest killers of women yeah my so mother actually time. yeah yeah my mother actually died of breast cancer so i haven't been i'm afraid to take estrogen although yeah. i can take their um there's like a cream for um like vaginal cream yeah, that helps that's... and um, testosterone helps with creating free estrogen, which has been super helpful. Progesterone helps mm -hmm. with the mental fog and the the night sweat. Yeah. So there's a, I feel like there's, you know, every body is different. And so there's like different combinations that you can yes. do depending on yeah. your own specific. Yeah. So, yeah. and then you help but people with the emotional piece as well. So you advocate for the hormone replacement therapy, like whatever combination, and then there's the emotional piece too. Yeah, exactly. So that's the, and again, like you said, it's, it's very much, there's, it's not one size fits all. And in the UK, you can go to the, the GP and you'll get given the bog standard, but obviously it's much better if you can get something tailored to yourself with a specialist. And I did that. Um, and a lot of it for me is just that it's just good quality information, accurate information yeah. so that you can advocate to your healthcare provider. It's also a process of symptom tracking so that you mm. can build a picture and then you can go, you can advocate for, for what it is. So when they go, no, no, that's fine. You go, no, actually I've been, I've been data collecting for a good three months and this is what's going on so i know um and just knowing what's available so from 45 if you would go to your gp hrt should be the first line that's offered to you if you go with your with symptoms and menopausal symptoms as we've we've discussed let me ask um, you about the uh sorry to interrupt you but i'm so curious about the symptom tracking so you recommend mm. three months so yeah. what thing like on uh, like how do you track and what do you track? So with the so how I do it because I've got um I, I use menopause mapping tool 
that that is um, the copyright of the menopause school it's like a journal and it breaks down the symptoms and you just like tick and you okay. and you just check in with yourself each day and you can do it on the you know there's um apps like flow and there's another one dr louise newson has one i can't even balance i think it's called where you can where you can track your symptoms um i mean going back even before that it's really good to do that if you're menstruating still if you're still having mm -hmm. your periods because again you have you know what as we go up towards ovulation say we are more extrovert and have more energy for example and then going down when you get the progesterone you're going to be more chill you're coming down the other side and you can structure your work around it like if you if we were really advocating for our bodies and our needs let's schedule all those podcasts all those high power business meetings around then when we've got our period we're like no I'm just catching up with a bit of admin you know that would be much better yeah so absolutely all of this reflective practice and data tracking is so useful for us yeah I love that um thank you for those resources for those apps because I think that's yeah I, I don't think uh women know to do this they don't know like I didn't know to track like yeah. I never paid attention every once in a while I'd go to my doctor and they'd be like when was the first day of your last period and after a while I was like I have no idea I don't yeah. know when the last one was I, I never paid attention to begin with and so they really didn't track it and what I know now is that um, because there's so much more education available about this is that there's actually a window of opportunity to insert HRT. And once that window, like that window will close, like after a certain point, you like, I think it's for estrogen that once you sort of, once that window closes, you, you can still take it, but the long-term benefits of like uh, dementia prevention actually diminishes. So it's really important yeah, that women track right. not only their cycles, but I love this idea of the checklist, like the symptoms and that, you know, that goes along with, you know, I love that the title of your book was Love Yourself Sober, because in my mind, healing really starts with loving yourself, like really learning to love yourself. I think as women, we have so much criticism and there's, there's, I mean, you just can't win. You know, if you lose too much weight, then people accuse you of having an eating disorder. If you're too heavy, they criticize you for not, I mean, there's just, there's just no winning for as, as women. So I think it's, you know, very natural for women to have low self-esteem. Mm -hmm. So the whole foundation for healing is, is learning to love yourself. And then if we could just train, I don't know if there's more that you want to say about menopause, but I do want to talk about your other book too. Mm, yeah. And I just, to speak to that though, and this, this really is that, that sobriety piece and then going into recovery is that foundational because yeah. I feel like that's the rip, that was the first important boundary. That yeah. I said no, to, no, I'm going to prioritize myself. I'm going to put myself mm. in the picture. I can then gather that I can get to know myself day in day out, so that I know. Because we, how do we love ourselves without knowing ourselves yes. as well, right? So all of these are tools to know ourselves and our needs better. Whether it's that journaling, checking in with with friends, you know that reflective practice that stops the gaze being out there and stops it all of our intel coming from outside as we do by women you know like like you say we can't win there's so much noise so we create that boundary and we check in with ourselves and that is our that is our guide that is our witness that is our empowerment um and these these are good tools to do that yeah no that's, that's brilliant I mean, yeah yeah yeah, knowing knowing yourself. And I was thinking when I was kind of taking notes, getting to know ourselves, getting to know the true selves, because there is that inner critic voice that's just really telling us lies mm -hmm. that leave yeah. leaves out all the good stuff. Right. So yeah. focusing on the on the good focusing on the good aspects. What you think about, you bring about. So if you're focusing on your good qualities, then I think that uh, makes it easier for us to really love and appreciate ourselves by taking those positive actions. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that I, I I see is another tool, but the second book that that y'all wrote, uh, what remind me of the title of that as well. That that is love so your pretty. sober year. Love I know, sober. It's so pretty, so beautiful. If you're not on so... YouTube, you should be because these books are amazing. Mm, 
so it's it's a very dark blue cover like lapis lazuli blue with the gold um illustrations and it's funny very celestial it is isn't it it is very <laughs> celestial and it's got the sun and the moon and and basically this is it's sort of grown up and so I would say that this book is very much about the maintenance bit all of those tools yeah. for ongoing that recovery that self-care but it's very much about a sustainable sustainable living sustainable sobriety by living in tune with the seasons like this yeah. idea that everything in nature is cycles it's seasons which kind of makes sense with the, the the menopause piece this is a season of our lives so we're not yeah. in that early bloom bit we're in that kind of maturing um you know that sort of that that so we're going to need different tools for each season so we can look at it in terms of physical season spring autumn summer winter yeah we can look at it in terms of seasons of our lives yeah um I very much feel like I remember in the first year of my my sobriety I really needed to update my toolkit every season because yeah. what cut it in the autumn wouldn't cut it in the summer because so I was like ah sun triggers beer gardens you know in the UK it's like I can't have hot chocolate I'm like ah so, yeah. so those are real practical mm. practical practical tools for each each season and and the idea for the book is that there's weekly topics and weekly journaling prompts around the kind of the literal meet the seasons but also the kind of vibe of them so for example we look at different cycles we try to be really clever about this right so say for example the stress the stress cycle so when we've got fight flight fawn or freeze response mm -hmm. okay which is really important for us to know right that dysregulation if our nervous systems are dysregulated we get triggered and then we get triggered to addictive behaviors right yeah so spring feels like fawn to me so that yeah. like, you know, little baby fawn where we're like, mm. so we'll, we go into the stress cycle and the fawn response and how to be kind to ourselves if we're in fawn response in the spring. In the summer, that feels like raw, angry, heat, rage, yeah. overwhelm, <laughs> fight response. So how do we dial down that real hot, like, mm. um, you know, and in the winter, it's like free, freeze response, you know, so. And we also, and I was thinking about the kind of element of what might be really beautiful and nurturing. So for me, winter could be around the fire. Um, mm. And so there's a thing about telling our stories and storytelling, Ooh, finding our sparkle. So yes. Yeah, so, so, so how do we tell our story and the power of community and storytelling? We've put in winter because that feels really nice and nurturing so yeah. that's the idea behind behind the book that you can just dip in and out if you want different tools or you could follow it you know if that's your yeah. job as well sort of chronologically I love a good journal prompt because sometimes other people will have questions that don't even come to mind and I sort of love this idea that um you know if you already had the answer you would have done the thing already yeah. right yeah. but sometimes there's like a, a missing piece mm. and just being able to um hear how other people think of things maybe it's a turn of phrase or a different mm. perspective that actually allows me to go inward check to check my own information to see if maybe there's something different there that I can absorb and then take a different action. I feel like everything starts with like your beliefs, your thoughts, you know, because then that's the place that we make decisions and action, take action from. So I love a good journal prompt. Yeah, because again, this goes back to that kind of cycles and spirals where things land differently. We can mm -hmm. come to something in our 30s. We come to a similar thing in our 40s. It will feel different and it will be different. It will land differently similar with a journaling prompt something it might land you know and then like months later you've metabolized it in a different mm -hmm. way you've experienced a whole other year of your life and it's gonna land perhaps in a more rich way or just in a different way it's like so I know I know what you mean I think that's what I'm trying to say is like yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and we can't always I don't know as women like sometimes I forget that I can go elsewhere. Like I'm, I'm loving um Liz Gilbert, 
Oh the my moment, gosh. Right. Because I, I know. So Dufflin uh, Lammers, yeah. who's another lovely sober sis. So she was, t- she's working with me on Love Sober Life School, which again we'll talk about. Oh, but, nice. Right? So she was talking about um, the letters from love and oh, starting yeah. doing that journaling prompt. Now I'm starting to do that journaling prompt in the morning. Which me is too. Dear, dear love, what would you have me know today? Oh, the <sighs> sobbing that is going on in West Sussex. Is that where you are? <laughs> I, I, I've been doing that too, because sometimes I'm like, yeah, well, you know, I had her on the podcast and then um, I've been following her sub stack and yeah. And she's just such a sweet and precious soul. Um, and, but what an interesting idea. It's like, what would love say to me? What would unconditional love say to me? So sometimes like yesterday morning was, dear God, what would you have me know about this? I have a situation that I was um, super triggered about. And I was like, what would you have me know about this? And then writing to myself from unconditional yeah. love, it was like, oh, simple you it's so to... powerful so Sorry, cool. powerful yeah, yeah no it's just uh it was just really powerful it was so nurturing it's like I don't I forget that I don't have to prove myself to anybody like if somebody misunderstands me it's not my job to correct them it's like you get to have whatever interpretation of me that you want and there is nothing there is nothing that I really I don't need anything from you Really? I don't need approval. I don't need your money. I don't need your, I don't need anything. I'm good. And I forget that. I forget that there's like this, um, there was, there was a situation I should probably talk about it, but there was a situation where I got a really good interview and I was excited about it. And I posted about it on social media, but I used the wrong picture. Turns out the picture I used was a AI generated image and the, um, the somebody from the team reached out to me uh, very alarmed and wanted me to take it down immediately, which I did. It was like, oh, my mistake. What picture would you like me to use? And they're like, let's just put the interview on hold. And I had already announced it to my audience. So it sent me into this weird shame spiral. I mean, I don't need this interview. It's fine. Like, no big deal, but it was the, it was the feeling of being misunderstood, or I guess they had had a, um, a scare where somebody used this person's images and created a fake Instagram account and was soliciting their followers. And somehow I was linked in that experience. And so I felt like they thought I was some sort of scammer because I made a mistake and used a, the wrong image. Do you know what I mean? So it was like, this, you know, I was embarrassed because I already yeah. announced it and they were just like, it sent me into this whole shame spiral. So I really had to go to that uh, letter from unconditional love to metabolize that experience. And it was like, oh, that's right. They, it was, it had nothing to do with me. I was taking it very personally, yeah. but it had nothing to do with me. Yeah. And, and it was like, oh, my power, my validation, all that comes from within, not whether this person knows who I am or not. Cause there was a part of me that was like, don't you know who I am? All I do is try to, all I do, I'm a helper. All I do is try to help people. I'm not here to hurt anybody. Yeah. That's not who yeah. I am. I'm not so, trying yeah, to hurt that anyone. misunderstanding and the sort of injustice of it, isn't it? Injustice like, and the embarrassment. Yeah. And, but it was yeah. weird how like it, really hit a nerve but the solution was to go to love like I was in fear the solution was to go to love yeah it's, I love that that's a great practice it is a great practice um it reminds me a little bit of when you were talking about that that it, it sort of can very very quickly resize a problem it can mm. shift from the reactivity can't it to that that different perspective it's like um the coaching tool uh resourceful selves i was talking to my husband about this the other day because we've got oh tell me the about issue. that so that is just but i think liz i think this is more powerful to be honest than yeah. what you just said but it's if you've got a a, a problem that you need to solve or a goal or an issue like whatever a quandary so you've got that in the middle you put it on a piece of paper on the floor what it is and then you've got yourself like what I think about that and then you get you kind of maybe have someone who you're you're a judge um what else a teacher a 
a football coach, a something or whatever, whatever, or your best friend. And then you would go and you would stand on these pitches oh. of pa paper and say, what would this, what do you imagine they would have to say about it? Oh, and it's just that. that, like, getting out of our way, that bit of cognitive flexibility and that able to, the perspective, perspective. Yeah, yeah. That's, oh, I love that too. That's really mm. good. I That'd like be quite that. a good game. I quite like that. I know, so. right? Yeah. <laughs> Let's so play good. resource for selves, kids. Oh my God. Like, yeah, right, all right. Yeah, right, mom. <laughs> <laughs> so funny um so tell me you kind of touched on it tell me about uh it's very close to mine sober life school you have sober love sober life school <laughs> yeah great minds right i don't know <laughs> love sober life school i like the liter alliteration of that so it's mm. ls ls yeah <laughs> it is ls ls spring summer 24 spring summer 24 so oh, okay been doing this for about four, four or four years i think four or five years now um it's a three-month group pro program and this day is basically we have daily content so you nice. get a course an online course um cycle through the weeks of kind of building basic sort of um habit change so finding mm. our feet we look up relationships and boundaries we look at our routines we look at our trigger times it's very much focused on that mum wine woman wine culture mm. thing about stress stress in the nervous system wine o'clock you know that that kind of language that mm -hmm. I've kind of grown up with in the UK um we then go through to the idea is that to really create what we're talking about you know that toolkit of stuff that makes us feel abundant that helps with the challenges so troubleshooting this you know what do I do when I socialize you know get your three drinks on board let the host know if you can get a wing woman leave early you know so practical tools but then also then we go into the hormone piece mm -hmm. um, the stress piece so all those those bits and then we also look at the science of happiness. So the the keys of, um, you know, or flow, play, creativity, self-compassion practice. So some of that, that, that deeper kind of toolkit. And that sounds like a lot and it kind of is, but it's very bite sized each day because we know that we do one day at a time. Like we know that. So we have to yeah. be checking in, data collecting, measuring mm -hmm. progress. We have a group call on a Sunday. So connect and reflect <sighs> sessions. We do it with a group. And then if you love, if something really chimes with you, there's a library of resources of like TED Talks, of further reading and everything. And it's you get it for life. So that's that's the love the love sober life school. Um oh, so probably good. my favorite thing to do. I love it. I love being with women for that amount of time, yeah. seeing the alchemy of the group um, and seeing it land, you know, seeing it land is like probably my biggest, happiest thing. Um, oh. And I do it with Dauphin Lammers, who is an awesome relationship and recovery coach. So I, I very much focus on habit change, midlife peace, sobriety. She comes in with the boundaries and the relationships. So oh, she's so good with relation. No, so she was on, she was Amazing. on the podcast too. And she, you know, we talked extensively about attachment theory and mm -hmm. all that stuff. So, so I, I love her. She's amazing. Um, I got to see her a couple of times. We got to, I got to see her in Paris. <laughs> Oh, Paris. When were you in Paris? We were in Paris. It was a year ago in September for our 25th wedding anniversary. Yeah, it was it was amazing. So her and her partner, I never say his name right, but I want to call him Benjamin. 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 Yeah. Benjamin. <laughs> for us the Yanks. Oh, but nice. um no, it was yeah, she's she's a beautiful soul. I'm so glad that you two have paired up and you're doing this. Is it 12 weeks? the yeah. course and then you have lifetime access yeah exactly yeah, yeah. that's really good no and that's oh, and, and oh, with go ahead. that you also get to uh because love sober community mm. uh, it's a group of amazing amazing women we've got a we've got a secret facebook group and peer support meetings so if you do love sober life school you also get that so you get a ton of support yeah. peer support meetings i do a monthly call um lots of chat in the group so it's it's robust you know it's not you know we've got to be um 
we we've got to be really what sort of have integrity haven't we around yeah and I feel like that's a good amount a good amount of support so yeah no I like that it's um consumable that it's not overwhelming but it, yeah it, I mean the beginning phase of recovery often is overwhelming but um it's just like anything else that once you kind of get into a routine and absorb the information it becomes second nature yeah. And, and 12 weeks is a really good amount of time to be able to, um, just know that the answers you need are coming and yeah. to have structure and support through the whole yeah. thing. It's really important. It's a, it's a really important transition. And I can see how this would be especially helpful for women in, in midlife mm-hmm. as they go through this process, the change as we, do you guys call it the change too? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And what is it? We've got we've got a brilliant um thing. We've got exciting things in the UK. I'm gonna kind of big up other people's things now, but it's sort of almost like two movements. There's the kind of real kind of hot meno pot, you know, where everyone's still <laughs> looking really hot and doing loads of weight training. And yeah. then we've got this kind of psycho spiritual aspect, which is yeah. things like Dr. Sharon Blackie, who does a program called Haggitude, which is very much about elderhood. <laughs> And, um, I know how it is. That's hilarious. So it's um, it's quite exciting in the UK at the moment in terms of that. And I feel like the two worlds can really come together. I feel like we can yeah. still be like, <clears throat> like getting our tattoos and doing our yoga and and going out <laughs> to kind of sober sober clubbing if we can be bothered maybe during the daytime. But also having a bit of a women's cycle and a bit of a witchiness going on. Yeah. I like to bring it all together. I like to bring it. I mean, I, you know, I feel like it's the fall, you know, like the menopause yeah. season is like the fall. And that is traditionally a time for reaping. Right. Yeah. And, you know, it's so nice to be able to have access to hormone replacement therapy. I got my libido back. Like we are having a second honeymoon up in here. I won't bore you with the details and our kids are out of the, are leaving the house. Like they're gone. One's at college and the other, um, is, uh, working and going to school too, but still lives here, <clears throat> but it's just, uh, man, it's a, it's a, great a time. we are having a good old time. We have more <laughs> money than we've ever had. We yeah. have more space. Like this is, this is a time this of, is a good time. this is a good time. Mm-hmm. Once you hand, I feel like the, all I needed was a little bit of hormones and life is good. Life is good again. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love that. But you know what you've just reminded me of is that in Chinese medicine, so it's called, it's referred to as the second spring. So oh. they go, you go through the fall and go into winter, but then we come through it and we have our second spring, which I think is really beautiful, which it mm. sounds like, it sounds like you are having your, uh, <laughs> yeah. A little bit we of a second spring summer. Second spring. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so fun. Love it all. Um, well, gosh, this has been so enlightening. Uh, I'm so glad we're talking about this and bringing all these solutions forward so that people can, you know, pick and choose what works for them. And, yeah. you know, for the men, it's like there is hope. <laughs> <laughs> you will get just, laid again you, you will, will get laid, get laid again. again yeah <laughs> you can have a second your wife can have a second spring <laughs> <laughs> things can get good again so good amazing work that you're doing thank you so much for Brina being a bright light in the world it's it's definitely needed oh it's been so lovely to talk to you thank you so much there's a fly here I'm not having a hot flush. I am a bit pink, right? What is going on with that? I think it's uh, your, I thought it was your sweater. Oh, it's it's beautiful. It's a okay. it's a beautiful blush. Yes. <laughs> All right, my dear. Well, thank, thank you, you so much. And uh I hope to talk to you again real soon. Yeah, thank you so much. It's great to talk to you. Bye, Alina. Yeah, bye.